Uh, you all get extra points for that. I'm Dan Rundy. I hold the Schreier Chair at CSIS. I'm very, very appreciative that all of you have come at such an early hour. Please take a seat, Minister, and please take a seat, my friend uh, J.P. Prosper. We're going to, um, we are um, hosting this conference in partnership with the Governor of Canada. Thank you very much, Canada. Uh, welcome, uh, Minister Paradis, who's the Minister of International Development for the Canadian Government uh, as part of the uh, Department of, of Foreign, uh, Foreign Affairs, Trade and Development, DFAT-D as it's known. Um, and my very good friend, uh, J.P. Prospera, is with us as well. We're expecting Minister Ba, the Minister of Finance of Senegal, shortly. Uh, this is uh, a very interesting conversation. We've had a very strong turnout of about 300 folks RSVP'd for this event. Uh, I think reflecting the fact that these are demand-driven topics in international development. These topics that we've chosen are topics in line with the post-2015 MDGs and the post-Busan Global Partnership, for those of you that follow these things. Um, I think these are some very interesting uh, topics that countries like Canada, countries like Australia, countries such as the Nordic countries that are donors, have an outsized contribution to make in these demand-driven topics. And these are topics that deserve more attention in Washington, and, uh, and these are also topics that no one country, whether it's the United States or Canada or others, can, can work on alone. Um, I want to just touch on each of the topics we're going to be covering in our agenda, and then we're going to, we're going to go, I'm going to turn the floor over to, to Minister Paradis to make some uh, remarks. Uh, you know, Washington doesn't give the Francophonie or the community of Portuguese-speaking countries, it doesn't get the same sort of attention they, they might deserve. I think the conversation we're going to be having about opportunities and challenges in the Francophonie, I think will be quite interesting to look at some of the development challenges. You have um, translation sets. Minister Parody has uh, asked us to conduct this conversation in French. I think it's appropriate. I think it'll be very interesting. I, my French is not so good, so I'm going to ask the questions in English, but I think our, our, our respondents are going to respond in French. So you will actually want to use your translation devices for that. Um, on the issue of trade and development, this is an issue that we've been working on for over a year. We have a Congressional Task Force report coming out on how to strengthen U.S. trade capacity building uh, uh, capabilities um, going forward in future trade deals, of which I hope there are many. Um, we also, on the issue of managing extractive wealth, uh, in 2013 there was an estimated $730 billion of global mining revenues, much of it in the developing world, something like five times the amount of all foreign assistance. In Africa, 51 of 54 countries have ongoing or planned oil and gas exploration. And export data from, for example, 2010 indicates that about over almost 60% of crude oil exports come from the developing world. So managing oil, gas, and mining wealth is a critical challenge in development. If you said to me, is this going to be more relevant or less relevant in the next five years, it's going to be more relevant. Well, Canada and Australia and Norway, for example, have a lot to teach us about how to manage these important resources, and so I think uh, we're really appreciative that we're going to have this conversation as well. Science and technology. Fifteen years ago, uh, if anyone said that there would be widespread cell phone use in Africa, I think people would have, would have shrugged that off. Ten years ago, if we talked about something like M-Pesa, which is a payment system in a number of countries starting in Kenya, people would have shrugged that off and wouldn't have believed it. Canada, Australia, the Nordics, the UK, and the US all have something to share, and oftentimes science, technology, and innovation is a two-way street. So we're going to be having a very interesting conversation about science, technology, and innovation. Um, finally, um, we're going to be talking about the fact that nine out of ten jobs in the developing world are in the private sector. So how we work and partner and support the private sector is an important part of development. We've spent three or four years here at CSIS working on these issues. Um, we, uh, so, and for those G7 countries that don't have development finance instruments or development finance instrument capabilities, this is a real opportunity to, to think about how to strengthen those or build those. Uh, my good friend Elizabeth Littlefield, who's the CEO of OPIC and is truly a great leader in international development, will be uh, making some remarks about DFIs at lunchtime, so please stick around for that. But without further ado, I'm going to turn the floor over to my good friend, Minister Paradis, who's flown in from Ottawa to be with us. Minister, over to you. Pleasure to be here today at this uh, conference uh, called Major Drivers for Development Agenda. It's a pleasure to be here with you today with uh, many key players 
in both policy and the private sector and the room. And we have a very, uh, a very exciting program before us. So I'd like to thank uh, C, uh, I, uh, C, 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 I, sorry, CSIS, these acronyms, for, C, yeah, exactly, CSIS, for welcoming us in their brand new facilities. And I would say, uh, Dan, you're the man. We just met in June. Here we are with uh, convening a lot of people for a great conference. So this is very exciting. And um, I'd like to thank also uh, CSIS for partnering with Canada to make this conference a success. And before we proceed uh, with, uh, with the first panel, I'd like to say a few words about Canada's contribution to development in the last uh, couple of years. So today, more than 1.1 billion people around the world still live in extreme poverty, trying to survive on less than $1.25 a day. How to keep these billion people from losing their daily struggle is a complex challenge that pushes us to redefine our approach to international assistance. So since 2006, Canada has long been at the forefront of the international development. And for me, this means going beyond the boundaries that have traditionally defined how development is done. At the core of our efforts lies a commitment to new partnerships and constant innovation. It's a commitment to smart development that evolves with the rapidly changing development landscape. It is in spirit that Canada is happy. It is in the spirit that Canada is happy to organize with CSIS this event today. As many of you know, international assistance is not what it used to be. Indeed, a great deal has changed since Canada began officially pursuing international development in the late 60s. Today, developing countries are increasingly global, uh, driving global gr growth and using economic development, trade, and investment to fuel their own progress. The importance of development assistance has decreased compared to other resources, and foreign direct investment to developing world now outpaces assistance by a five to one margin. Eliminating extreme poverty and promoting global prosperity are two sides of the same coin. Partner countries in Africa, for example, have long said that they need more than just development assistance. How many times I heard from my counterpart, we don't need aid, we need trade. So friends, what we know is they need access to the knowledge and expertise that can help them to mobilize their own resources and capabilities. And with private sector investment, they can reinvest the public revenues into the health and well-being of their own citizens. I think Canada is in an especially good position to help developing countries to meet these challenges, both institutional and economic. Canada weathered the global financial crisis better than most of our trading partners because, uh, because Prime Minister Harper had a plan. Today, Canada has the best employment record in developed countries. Nearly 1.1 million jobs have been created since the recession. Canada experience can definitely be an asset for several developing countries. Canada was the one of the first donors to promote the central role of sustainable economic growth in international development, and it remains a top priority. More recently, when our, when our government merged the Department of Foreign Affairs and International Trade with the Canadian International Development Agency, which is now DFADI, we're working on branding, by the way, then, as you know. Yeah, DFADI sounds, uh, anyway, we it's can like, be better. It's like CSIS. <laughs> exactly. More recently, when our government, uh, so, so uh, when we uh, merged, it was to capitalize on the full potential of the interrelation between foreign policy, development, and trade. We are now beginning to reap the benefits of this merger. We believe that this coherence will lend greater weight to our efforts at all levels. As Minister of La Francophonie, I can now attest to the benefits of the merger in this specific area also. With, it, with, with its partners, for example, Canada is currently leading an effort to ensure that La Francophonie adopts an economic strategy. The recognition of the department allows Canada to push for a strategy that will consider the different levels of development of francophone countries while we ensure that trade and development are on equal footing. We have demonstrated commitment to international development since the earliest days of our governments. In the 2006 uh, budget, our government reaffirmed Canada's commitment to double international assistance to $5 billion in 2010-2011. But it was also clear to us that 
to give a new impetus to our international assistance, we had to make some changes to existing policies and practices. At the time, Canada's assistance was too scattered among too many countries and too many themes. Moreover, this situation was noted in a critical report by the OECD on Canada's aid policies. In 2007, we therefore adopted an aid effectiveness action plan. We then decided to focus our energy and, uh, and efforts geographically and thematically where Canada could take a leading role. And I think that no example can illustrate the success better than our global leadership role in maternal, newborn, and child health since 2010. Before, Prime Minister Harper drew the world's attention to the crucial issue, to, to the crucial issue of maternal, newborn, and child health. We were having trouble reducing maternal and child mortality. Thanks to the Muskoka Initiative and the resulting global action, maternal mortality rates are going down and millions more children are able to celebrate their fifth birthday. It is our top development priority that I am proud to say was reinforced by Prime Minister Harper in May at the Saving Every Woman, Every Child Global Summit in Toronto. Heads of governments, industry and civil society organizations came together to build consensus on how to redouble international efforts to reduce the preventable deaths of mothers, newborn and child, children under the age of five in, the, in uh, developing countries within a generation. The summit reaffirmed that we are on the right track, that saving every woman and every child is within arm's reach, and that redoubling our efforts is a necessity if we are to meet our goals. It also reaffirmed that this issue must retain at the center of our post-2015 global development agenda. In Toronto, the Prime Minister announced that Canada will provide $3.5 billion over five years to support maternal, newborn, and child health. This commitment will build momentum in the global effort to save the lives of millions of babies, children, and mothers, and help them to grow and thrive. We already saw results two weeks ago in New York when President Kim of the World Bank and other leaders, including Prime Minister Harper, announced the founding of the Global Financing Facility for Every Woman, Every Child. As a founding partner, Canada will contribute $200 million toward the facility, toward the facility as part of our $3.5 billion commitment announced in the Toronto Summit. Housed at the World Bank, the facility will provide the critical financial infrastructure to mobilize the capital required to scale up health services for women and children. And in particular, the new facility will establish a multi-donor platform to help developing countries to build and strengthen their CRVS system, which is a crucial, crucial need. Development has now become a global endeavor in which partners from across a section of areas work together to meet the needs of the world's poor. It used to be squarely the domain of government development agencies, charities, and international organizations. Canada is furthering its development priorities by working closely with a multitude of partners. And there is no type of partner that alone can enable us to overcome all challenges. Each stakeholder has its reason for being. And as I said earlier, we know that sustainable economic growth drives poverty, poverty reduction, and the private sector drives economic growth. It is thus vital to partner with the private sector to raise people from poverty and set them on the path to the prosperity. Meaningful jobs, better education, and training, and improved health and nutrition for mothers and children can all lead to an increased likelihood for overcoming poverty. And these are all increasingly attainable when the private sector is better connected to global development efforts. Since I became Minister of International Development, one of my priorities has been to make sure Canada is at forefront of the efforts to leverage local, Canadian, international, and multinational private sector actors. It is why I was proud to be named chair of the Redesigning Development Finance Initiative known once again with another acronym, RDFI. The RDFI is a joint global project be between the World Economic Forum and the Development Assistance Committee of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. 
Its main objective is to expand the pool of foreign and domestic capital to help accelerate social and economic progress. And its main tools are, one, identifying and testing innovative public-private finance models, and two, scaling up blended finance partnerships. That being said, I recognize that we have some improvements to make on this front. The Canadian private sector does not participate in development in its full potential. Many have identified the lack of a Canadian development financing mechanism to explain the situation. This is something I have taken seriously, and I'm currently consulting to see how best respond to the situation. Many other non-traditional partners can help Canada to overcome the challenge of de development. There is no doubt that innovation is vital to the, to, to the achievement of development results. And Canada's scientific and technological community is one of our greatest assets. Since the department has long been active in developing countries, it has a very unique perspective on the field. And I want the department to connect our s and ecosystem with the needs of the developing world. There is also the influx of immigrants from other countries, which has created diasporas or expatriate communities whose activities have an impact on development. With transfer totaling nearly $24 billion in 2012, Canada is the third largest source of remittances to developing countries. This is more than four times of the official development assistance that is flown out of Canada. So these remittances help to reduce poverty and meet basic needs in several developing countries, but they are certainly an opportunity once again to uh, optimize and leverage on this regard. So there must be greater recognition of this significant contribution by our fellow citizens, and we cannot do uh, without this valuable cooperation. Diversifying our partnership is crucial to the future successes of our aid program, and there is no lack of opportunity to do so. But it, just, it is just an important to main, as important to maintain the quality and strength of our longest standing partnership with civil society. And for this reason, as minister, have made great effort to establish ties with civil society. I had often heard people talk about how our partner organizations splendidly represent Canada and the world. And since becoming Minister of International Development, I have the chance to see this with my own eyes. Through their activities to assist poor and vulnerable communities, partner organizations are, uh, embody Canadian values worldwide. I know that by working with our traditional partners in civil society, we can have a great impact also on development. So, in conclusion, as a nation, as a people, Canadians are motivated by the need to help those less fortunate than ourselves. However, we must, we must never lose sight of the fact that citizens expect Canadian aid to deliver tangible results. We are better equipped today than ever before to reduce poverty and to invest our development assistance funding where it will have the greatest impact. Canada will lead by focusing on the impact of its activities and by developing innovative solutions that can change lives. So my hope is that today's conference will contribute to the development of such innovations in Canada and around the world. The world. So thank you again, Dan, and the team for having this uh, terrific conference. Great. Thank you very much, Minister. Thank you. Great. I think we're going to jump right into the uh, conversation about uh, development challenges and opportunities in the Francophonie. Um, I'm going to introduce my two friends and then we're going to get right into it. So uh, you, of course, have met Minister Paradis. He's the Minister for Development uh, for the Canadian government. And then my very good friend, uh, Jean-Philippe Prosper, who's the Vice President for Client Services at IFC. JP happens to be Haitian, uh, but is a global citizen, and uh, JP has had a very distinguished career at the International Finance Corporation, which is the private sector arm of the World Bank Group, and prior to that was at the Inter-American Development Bank at the private sector arm. 
And prior to that, worked um, in, a, in a private sector finance institution in Haiti. So brings a global perspective, understands Haiti, of course, but also understands the challenges and opportunities in West Africa, including Francophone West Africa. So my French isn't so great, but I'm, so I'm going to ask the questions in English. But I know that we were going to conduct this conversation in French, and so you should use your your uh, translation devices, and then afterwards re re return them uh, as well. It looks like our friend Minister Ba has uh, something has come up, and we won't be won't be able to join us at the last minute. And I apologize for that, but we're going to go ahead and because the show must go on. Okay. So when I think about um, when I think about Haiti, or I think about many parts of West Africa, um, oftentimes in the United States, I think in Canada. Uh, there's a perception that these are mainly, there are main, only challenges to think about. I disagree with that. I think there are many of incredible opportunities. I'd be curious to, from both of your perspectives, when you think about the opportunities in countries like Haiti or the opportunities in Senegal, I'd be curious about how you, how you both see that. And I'll, I'll, let me start first with my friend JP. When you think about ch opportunities in Senegal and Francophone West Africa and Haiti, when, when, you know, from your perspective at IFC, what do you see? <clears throat> I guess I have to rise to the challenge to do it in French. No, pas parce que je ne peux easier used to to get those conversations in English. So I, I have to recalibrate. Um, we, écoutez, um, d'abord, first of all, we as I'm going to we take care of the French-speaking Africa and those countries. We're going to speak uh, uh, Haiti. In terms of opportunities, I think that you have to you have to see what has happened in, in in the past. If I take the the example of Haiti and what we've seen in the last few years, and there has <coughs> there's been a lot of a certain number of reforms who have helped the companies in our countries, and it's thanks to these reforms that the the climate for investment is better than it was before, and there's still a lot to be done, but there's been a lot of progress, and uh, I will take the next slide, uh, the investments, IFC, and I'm talking about some sub-Saharan -Sah -Sub Africa, our investments uh, went, for, we began the great wave of reforms, and I see in, the, in this room, we see a former CEO, He's a great visionary, and, and I recognize his acknowledge his presence. It's, he's the one that started, and there was a great decentralization effort. And we had, we were, I remember when we I went to Africa, uh, we, we, uh, there was a, there was about fifteen million dollars in the third uh, the last three years. Now there's a billion dollars of exchange that gives you an idea of the exponential growth in this because essentially the opportunities, there's more opportunity because because there's certain, a certain number we've uh, contributed, we, we've been able to help. Uh, if there, we we couldn't have done it if there was if there were no private investors because the financing is mainly the the uh, private to we we only supported these investors and we have a lot to think as you were said and there's been a certain number of reforms in terms of infrastructures which is very important for Africa you can't have development in Africa or anywhere else and and unless you have appropriate infrastructure, and I take the sector of energy and electricity. And until three years ago, uh, even an excellent day, uh, and about $200,000 million, now we're doing more than a billion dollars and the most uh, and most of it in the sector energy sector we we are also doing a lot in the, the sector of agriculture and agribusiness and the uh, past uh, fiscal year we we've meant many millions of dollars and and what 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 are we saying here yes there are opportunities and there, there's a lot of opportunities in the in the sector of and the uh, of uh, natural resources and raw materials, but there's also agribusiness where there's a lot of possibilities. 
and we can uh, we can talk about the financial sector. There's an exponential growth in this sector. Uh, many uh, uh, financial groups have, have have merged. I would say there's lots of challenges. There's uh, there remains a lot to be done, and we are working with the governments, both in terms of assistance, technical assistance, or SERPIT, or services to the government, and by working with the uh, the, the private sector. That's essentially what I would say for Africa in general and uh, West Africa in particular. That has been also the case. I will take uh, the 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 fragile companies like countries like. Ivory Coast, the re renewal today, uh, because uh, uh, the war between, uh, in, in uh, we've been able to um, inv invest more than a billion dollars in the energy sector, and we talked about Haiti, Haiti also. Haiti, as you know well, has had a lot of problems, that not only political problems, but the famous earthquake and the, the problem of reconstruction. I'm pleased to say we have done our part and uh, we've contributed to the reconstruction of Haiti and we have a lot of programs in Haiti for technical assistance, but also in terms of investment programs, we are going to invest over the 12 next months uh, about $100 million in Haiti's and very important uh, uh, projects uh, for investment, but we were investing in agribusiness and also in the uh, financial sector. That's what I have to say essentially. Minister. Merci beaucoup, uh, um, alors, uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, the Francophonie, I think it's, it is important to, to put some figures and uh, to put in francophonie it's a uh, it's about 77 countries uh, uh, 225 million people that are uh, that are spread over five continents and francophonie is a uh, is 15 percent of the uh, gross world product and francophonie offers an Im immense potential for growth because uh, 60 60 percent of the Francophone are below the age of 30 or less and I would like to when you say when you say there are opportunities there's a lot of future in, in the French-speaking countries in terms of, uh, of economic development the main sectors uh, we've talked a lot about inf infrastructure, uh, energy, mining, and uh, health and education. What we're doing in, in Canada, uh, being a, we're a full-scale member of uh, Francophonie, we are the second biggest donor in, uh, in Francophonie. And, uh, and uh, since uh, 2010, and clearly, we are remaining uh, uh, we in the francophonie there's a uh, there's development that is uh, that is relevant it's a French uh, French speaking community that's transparent and uh, it, that is going to help uh, the advancement of the rule of law and democracy and the and the the rights of uh, women and children and other people I'm talking about uh, Senegal in general we have an organization that is uh, in full form and and uh, works out about language culture and diversity and uh, good basic rights and uh, transparent transparency and uh, good governance and this and uh, 2010 and at the concession declaration we talked about a, an economic strategy we worked on this as member countries, and it will be d adopted in the future. And uh, on the 9th of November, that is coming up, uh, we uh, we uh, we want an economic strategy that's not static. It to create dynamism, to create uh, e economic interaction between the, among the members of the francophone community and uh, to do things in the future when we think uh, uh, and uh, when we think of Canada uh, with our market action plan for the uh, the development of markets uh, and uh, uh, 
we are trying as we can, as Mr. Prosper has said, we have to support, but we have to also be sure that we have a, a legal framework and a business framework that is uh, that is adequate to to stimulate investment. This means to have uh, agree agreements for the protection investments. We signed with the uh, Ivory Coast, with Senegal, with uh, with uh, countries like Benin, and w we at Calicre we started to uh, an agreement to, to create a legal framework, uh, framework that to uh, uh, will assure the uh, the security of investors in different sectors. Uh, we have to come to agreement when we talk about about the uh, the dynamics of the uh, summit and uh, to look for players for development. And a lot of people in West Africa are concentrating on the advance of women and also the development of agriculture. We also know that women can uh, play an important role in their f daily function to earn their living. It's, a, it's the whole family that benefits from this. Uh, they can go to the school, they can get educated, and this is something that helps a, a good number of projects that are that are uh, uh, advancing in this sector. And we can hope that we have economic uh, de development that is broader with uh, investments that come from uh, countries like uh, Canada and the United States. We talk about Haiti and my side. It's sure that there are a lot of challenges. There are t political challenges, and if we look in the future, what can we, what can we do, to be optimal in the reconstruction of Haiti, and uh, we, in Canada, what we're trying to look for is uh, to take advantages that that Haiti has had uh, with this uh, with this uh, tragic uh, earthquake that occurred in 2010 and what we can do for the infrastructure and we are looking uh, we're we're try looking for an innovative process to do more to to start from the fundamentals to help Haiti to uh, to uh, help to Haiti to have more and more uh, economic development process. We're looking, of course, looking for uh, narrow uh, collaboration so that the government Haiti can do what it can and, uh, and so we can have a legal framework for have security for investments so that within uh, uh, Sustainable investments that will help the growth of the economy and the and the education and to lift Haitians out of poverty. Thank you very much. When I think about IFC, I agree with you that 15 years ago there was only a small amount of investment, and uh, both IFC and the World Bank, in partnership with governments like Canada, like the United States, other donors, uh, supported a major uh, set of reforms, uh, the doing business indicators and improving investment climate. And my friend Peter Boyke is here; he's in the audience. The former CEO of IFC was a, was a great innovator in that respect, and so I appreciate you recognizing him as well. Could you talk a little? But, and, and when I look at the list of the opportunities, agribusiness, infrastructure, energy, and mining, education, as well as also thinking about how to include women in the private sector, I see. I think of IFC as being active in all of those areas. The other thing, I, when I think about IFC, is that it is in some ways similar to the Francophonie, a transmission belt of learning across countries. Could you just talk a little bit more about how, whether it's in, for example, it could be between Haiti or, or in West Africa or other other parts of the of the francophone world how does IFC whether it's the francophone world or not how does IFC uh, take lessons from one part of the world and bring it to another that would be some one question for you in terms of how IFC does its business um, and then I think the other question for you JP would be is when I think about parts of Africa including francophone West Africa there's a lot of a good there's a good news story there and uh, I would how, what is it going to take from in terms of the sorts of reforms that are going to be necessary to turn Haiti into the same sort of good news story. If you could just take, think a little bit about what, what's it going to take uh, on the economic side or the economic reform side 
to, to make Haiti a, a good news story. So those are the, my two questions for you. One is about IFC and is serving as a transmission belt and talking a little about how you transfer learning. And the second is, how do we turn Haiti into, the, into a good news economic story? Because if you'd look back 20 years in many parts of Africa, it was all a bad news story, and that's changing with challenges. And I think I want to believe, and I do believe, that it, it could happen as well as Haiti. And for you, Minister, I think one of the questions is, how should we think about the Francophonie as a transmission belt, and how should the United States and Canada better leverage its relationship with the broader Francophonie as part of its larger development and diplomacy strategy. I'm going to ask my friend JP to go first. Um, merci. Thank you. Yeah, at the level of IFC, how do we share the different the different experiences that we have from one country to another? Essentially, we, we try to establish information systems uh, uh, to do some knowledge management so that we can ensure that training, what we did in one country or another, we can always, if we want to do a similar project in another part of the world, we can benefit from the internal experience. That's done. And this is done today, I wouldn't say in an informal manner, but, but, not, but not in a sufficiently systematic uh, manner. And that's one of the reasons uh, for which we are currently uh, reviewing how we restructure um, the current structure. Now, since October 1, we no longer have a regional vice president. So before October, until th September 30th, I was a vice president covering uh, Latin America and Africa, which allowed, from that point of view, to cross have cross specialization between Latin America and Africa. I was there, I saw both. Um, but now we only have one um, sole vi global vice president, um, global plan services, and we have two co-chairs, me and a colleague. The objective now is to um, to manage the institution in a global manner and, um, and avoiding cleavage from one region um, to another. Uh, we want more fluidity, more transfer of experience from one region to another. Um, we have just begun. Uh, we're going to see how it will happen. We hope it will work, but that's the objective, or at least one of the objectives. Um, so roughly talking about this subject, how we're we going, trying to improve it. Now, the second point, um, what should we do to change? I must say that it's a little difficult, given that I'm Haitian myself, so I'm a little uh, <laughs> ill at ease. I'm going to uh, make a little bit of, not a joke, but a comment. It may not be politically correct. Uh, I remember about 15 years ago, maybe more, say 20, and I had um, a, a, a Haitian who was university professor in Washington and who worked <coughs> at the uh, inter American Bank. Um, he was well-known. Uh, I went to see him. Um, what do you see as a solution? How do we change things? And he said, uh, I'm going to speak, uh, translate, because we spoke in Creole. Um, that was not in the economics textbook. Um, it's a little in bad taste, but it's just to say that really uh, the, it's a relatively complex problem, and I think it involves more, in my opinion, of, of governance in, in the large sense of the term, not only um, about how to manage you know, one thing or another, but to implement structures and institutions that permit the country to function. I'll take an example. Um, if if you take the example of the Canada, of Canada, uh, 
you could put a robot there as a president and the institutions would work. Uh, if you take other countries, it's a little bit the same, but in some countries like Haiti, we don't have this type of institution, and I think, in my opinion, we must first create these institutions, implement systems, as I said, of governance, and especially and create, and that's uh, going in my, to be in my humble opinion, the re result of education of the majority of the people, which Haiti has not done, uh, which the Asian elite has not done, even people who had the opportunity, um, like me, who had an opportunity to study and, and do have a nice academic career. I think it's a, it's a failure of the Haitian elite. Uh, we must ensure that um, the majority of the population, that if they're educated, they'll be able to ask for more. They will can be more demanding from their government. So for me, it's what's to be debated. It's not just an economic problem. Um, so to, here's what I would say. Um, thank you. I like the expression when we talk about francophony, how it would be seen as a transmission belt, I mean as a learning belt. Um, this, we talk to each other. Francophony is trying to define itself among its members as a transmission belt for learning. Uh, as I said before, uh, we can build on this rich heritage uh, that was given to us by the Secretary Duf, uh, be a strong francophony, and that also has a lot of assets. We can't neglect them. We have preserved them uh, in terms of good governance, transparency, democracy. Um, we must build on what's been done up to date. For example, um, when a country, a francophone country, uh, and we cannot be excluded um, if there is a problem to be excluded and re-included. Uh, it's a very important tool. Uh, it's, it's, we have, it has seen more and more in the world. Um, there's more and more pressure on the country in question. We have to go to a second phase, uh, which is to have an economic strategy that develops the economic block. Uh, with the Francophony, when you uh, talk about 77 states that are members, and that's about 900 million people, you, you need, um, there are people that are adhering, um, joining uh, this movement and observators, observers that want to join in because they see growth in this area. I really believe in it. Uh, it can be a transmission belt for learning. I have a good hope that uh, following Dakar, we can go forward with a, an economic strategy that will be dynamic. Uh, and the uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Senegal told me that following uh, the Dakar summit in November, the following Monday, um, there will be an economic forum that will be held. Um, there have also been meetings uh, that have been held, uh, be it in Mexico in the spring or the World Economic. Um, Francophone actors are, are getting together more and more to, to agree on the future um, so that we may uh, continue to this second phase, which is the economic phase. Um, that becomes interesting because for countries like Canada, the US, um, I think that once again, it establishes a level of security for investors, um, even on a legal point. Um, that is makes for a serious approach. Um, the members of the Francophony, 24 of the members member states uh, that have the lowest indicators in terms of development. Um, there's an enormous potential, uh, but knowing that they are serious, uh, that they 
we cannot just look at simply the forms of aid, but also the forms of investment for economic growth. And there is an appetite for this. And Canada and the US and other countries can really gain from a partnership because we can share our expertise, the technical expertise. Uh, whether it be in the realm of health or infrastructure, education. Um, there are other countries on the other side that say, yes, we have to do business together because we want to, to move in the economic world progress. One last question for you. I know you have a meeting um, with the CEO of EIB in uh, a few minutes, so I, I really appreciate you taking time out of your schedule. I know the minister also appreciates it very much. Could you just give us a couple parting thoughts about if you're, if you're, if when you look as a, someone who's a Haitian and an expat Haitian, as also someone who's worked all over the world, including in West Africa, if you think about the, the challenges and opportunities that you see in West Africa and Haiti, where should the United States and Canada, how could they best uh, work with IFC? What would you love to see? How could they be? How could the United States and Canada work more closely with IFC on, on opportunities in Haiti and in West Africa? There may be certain things you're thinking about either say, and either there's a new investment climate facility, or you may be thinking about new opportunities in infrastructure. There may be new opportunities in education or health or, or gender. I know there are any number of different ideas are constantly bubbling up at, at IFC. I'd be curious if there was some, one or two opportunities that come to mind that are currently in your inbox right now in either Haiti or in West Africa, you think, boy, it would be so important for Canada, the United States, to get involved here that, they, that we ought to be seizing together, IFC and, and partners like the United States and Canada. Um. Uh, merci. About, about money, I think uh, actually money will flow if uh, you have the right conditions and uh, I mean private investors, wherever they can make money, they will go, they will go after it and try to make money. Um, I think one of the strongest roles they can play is by virtue of their influence with these governments to make, to in, to make sure that the proper help push the proper reforms and also on the governance. And I'm, I'm insisting on, on this, not that the, frankly, uh, the African countries or Haiti have worse governance than anybody, than anywhere else, or than some countries of Eastern Europe or others. I mean, double the number of countries have governance issues, period. However, if you don't fix that, it, it, you're not going to have sustainable investment. So I think this is going to be very important. That's one. Um, and I don't want to take example in the mining sectors. I mean, I'm sure the Canadians know about <laughs> tons of examples, and we know some where we have had issues, uh, so I won't go into specific countries. Um, second, I mentioned earlier when I was talking about electricity, I was talking about infrastructure in, in general. There is no way you are going to develop a country when people have to pay 30 cents, 40 cents, or 50 cents sometimes a kilowatt. I mean, which company can be competitive in doing that? It's madness. That's not going to happen. You are not going, so if we talk about um, you have to develop more, let's say, agribusiness, not just send the raw materials or the products that you have, Africa, just export them, just not to do that, but get more value added locally and build more in the value chain and do more, create more jobs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the only way you are going to do that is that if you can be competitive. Now, as I said, with those, if you are paying those amount of money for a per kilowatt hour, it's not going to happen. If to ship a good from, let's say, um, took from one country to another that may be close to each other, but because of the way the transport system is, um, it costs much more money than if you have to make it coming all the way from the US or from China or wherever, it is not going to be competitive. So clearly, I think infrastructure is going to be another area where we can work together, and more importantly, we can bring the private sector into that in public-private partnerships if you have the proper reforms and the proper business environment created. And as I said, we have plenty of examples. I was mentioning earlier um, how much money that we have been able to put. I think I was saying like five years ago, we are putting $200 million at best. And now, I mean, last, the last two years, we have done an average of uh, about a billion dollars mm -hmm. in infrastructure 
let's say in Africa, and it is just our contribution, and we have uh, some uh, uh, mobilization, but very little there. So clearly, those two areas, and the third area, I think, which is absolutely fundamental, I mean, agribusiness, a lot of these were included, but access to finance, because in those countries, it is proven, I'm not inventing studies done by economists, by others, about 90% of the jobs are created by small and medium companies. Now, if small and medium companies cannot proper, have proper access to finance, well, are they going to be able to invest? And if they don't have the proper environment framework, we talk about, um, let's say, ease of doing business. We talk about, I mean, this is not, even when we look at the doing business for country to improve, this is not for the big companies. If I'm a large company and to, to get my goods from customs, let's say it could take three days or four days or whatever because there's so many procedures and blah, 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 and you have to pay people a lot of money to do that. Well, I can hire somebody and pay maybe $50,000 or sixty or $80,000 a year to take care of these things. But if you're a small and medium uh, enterprise, and it's your, turn your turnover is 100 or 200,000 dollars, you cannot afford to do that. And as I said, if it's 90% of the jobs are created by them, if you don't fix that environment, forget about it. So I think those are the three areas that I would mention. Of course, you can have others, but that's what I would prioritize that. JP, thank you. I'm going to hope the minister, minister will stay because I want to ask him about moral suasion and perhaps using the Francophonie and Canada's moral suasion with countries in the Francophonie, as well as responding a little bit to these opportunities in mining and infrastructure and access to finance. Thanks again, JP, for being with us. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thanks, bye. I think that, because I want to make sure that the French audience hears this, when we think about the issues of governance and the issues of moral suasion, I think when I think about Canada, I think a lot about the the Canadian brand, and I think a lot about leveraging that Canadian brand in the Francophonie. Talk a little, you mentioned a little bit about this issue of, of using political pressure and not excluding folks, but also using it as a way to have, I think, frank conversations, if we can put it that way. Talk a little bit about how, how Canada thinks about issues of governance and how it uses its moral suasion on, on, on challenges in, in Africa and Haiti and elsewhere. Oui, uh, merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Um, excellent question. I think it's uh, basic, it's fundamental. In fact, when uh, partner countries uh, say we're going to have trade exchanges not only for development and aid, um, that means that it can be attractive. Uh, so it's important to implement uh, a legal framework uh, to find agreements and the protection of investments uh, and also to improve uh, governance overall, um, public management, government management. We say in Canada to our investors uh, to say, well, oh, you should uh, interest yourselves in developing countries, uh, but uh, of course they are used to deal in attractive environments, in good environments. And so we have to emphasize this message. The Francophonie is a very relevant organization. As long as people, uh, move, some people move away from these values, and that could be very serious on a diplomatic level. Um, this is a tool that we have to use, uh, but from the side of Canada, we are doing this constantly. When we talk of branding and of Canada, uh, you could say that uh, we talk about the mining sector. It's extremely important um, because in Canada, we're the best ambassadors of the mining sector. We have a lot to share. Uh, we have to take away this, this ghost of, of uh, mistrust that people are going to come in, take all the resources. Um, on the contrary, the partnership is a win-win. Um, I've, uh, you know, specifically talked about um, we've committed to an important dialogue with civil society because if we're going to have projects that are going to um, be good uh, for extractive companies, uh, we must be committed. My, we have to say my specialty is the development of um, exploding a mine, um, but if we're going to be better in the community, um, the 
government can take, bring people together and say, are you thinking of doing a deal with such a person, such a company, and I have all this equipment on in the field in terms of development. Um, I can name one project, Tech Resources, um, who are now in certain countries, and they're going to do zinc distribution. Uh, we realized there was a problem with the growth of small children. Um, OTEC is a producer of produces zinc. Um, there are connections there that can be made. The community can reach a win-win situation. Um, some will go in um, projects for um, training the workforce uh, for health uh, installations. Um, I want to say that I'm proud to say that there is more and more Canadian branding. Um, especially for action plans for extractives uh, over the next quarter. Uh, we're not doing it on the short term. We're doing it on the long term. We want to have a durable engagement within the community because by working together, we're going to have economic development and uh, social development in the community. Uh, and that means that everybody wins. Uh, so that's why I really want to eliminate uh, the private sector, the view of the private sector as the bad guy. Um, there is really a partnership that can be brought about. Uh, the government has a role to play. Uh, a dialogue, a very strong dialogue has taken place uh, with civil society over the last few months. Uh, we talked with civil society and they gave reports. Um, what are we expecting as the government? What is our role? What do we want to do? With the development, we're here, um, but we can go further. We can. We have to bring people together, the private sector, foundations, civil society. And what are we expecting from each other? We need a, a policy, a draft policy paper that's been put online in order to survey people and to ask, what do you think of this? Uh, so we had an interactive dialogue uh, and we have come up with a more, we want to have a more systematic solution for the future and that includes the different actors. Everybody has a role to play. It's not one or the other, it's everyone together. It cannot be done alone. Um, and we must transcend um, not just the Canadian approach, but when we talk with our partner countries, everybody participates and we're all together. Um, and now you're aid minister, so when I think about Haiti, could you talk about Canada's economic and development engagement in Haiti a little bit? Because I think it's important for this audience and for the audience watching this to understand that the engagement of Canada in Haiti is not just a is not just an assistance one, it's, you're one of the largest bilateral donors, but I'd be curious about the role of the private sector in, in Haiti and how those two blend now that you're in this new role. I suspect you, you've got a perspective on that. We oui, effectivement. Yes, in fact, uh, there are a lot of challenges in Haiti, and I think, like Mr. Prosper said, in fact, reflects, uh, I, I share his view uh, on economic projects. The economy, we must um, address the basic needs, uh, the political aspect, uh, but we have to also uh, strengthen the capacities of the state, uh, whether it be governance or um, um, implementing uh, measures for the business world and also the state of law and establish a legal system and we need um, predictability if there are lawsuits on the horizon. There's work to be done in this area. That's a dialogue that we're continuing um, to have with our friends uh, in Haiti. How, how do we help Canada to help to strengthen the capacities? Um, the Prime Minister Lamotte is very active in uh, supporting investment, and that's that's to his credit. Um, but you know, there's a side that says, if people, if you come here, how how can I be, how can I better manage the risk uh, if I come here? Uh, and the state, we have to work to ensure that. So if we can strengthen certain capacity. Um, we can share some expertise and it's a continuous uh, dialogue that is evolving. When we talk of economic 
projects, some projects are working well. I went to Haiti myself and I saw what I saw in uh, the region. And I, in terms of microfinance, there are some very interesting projects of microfinance um, that are cooperative uh, for um, regional um, boxes. There's um, 400,000 savers uh, in a region, so that's families. Families can now send um, children to school. Um, school charges are paid once a year, so for an ordinary worker, that's a, that's a big sum. And that's almost prohibitive. That's very hard to get. Uh, so with microfinance centers, um, the annual costs are amortized over a monthly um, plan. So the families have access to education for their children. Seems simple, but problems like this, that, that's how you strengthen a generation um, so that people have access to basic needs such as education, and that's how we can hope to have a, a type of development that is better for the future. Um, there are other projects at the agricultural level that I saw that were very interesting. A lot of partnerships being formed, uh, whether in with the Canadian Federation of Municipalities for um, but also projects um, with agricultural financing of Quebec um, that's to say that there's potential there um, and the key um, and and I understand it for having been there, but having also consulted the diaspora, which is uh, very important, what we're being asked to have as a role, uh, what we can do is bring people together to have a dialogue in terms of partnership. If people get together and imagine and create partnerships, uh, you can establish a dialogue. Um, um, a dialogue that will not be uh, stagnant um, and from a more macro level as a government we must continue to, to, to talk among ourselves, to establish priorities, not to have 25 priorities, um, but to find hubs, central hubs, uh, to develop fundamentals so that the government is working on these fundamentals and and so that we create an environment that is attractive to uh, investment. Um, this is, this, this will allow us to better group our affairs together in the, in the future, but we have to really strengthen partnerships. Thank you very much. I thought this was absolutely fascinating. We don't often have conversations uh, that looks at uh, these parallel structures with the Francophonie or the community of, of Portuguese-speaking uh, countries, and I think that there is a transmission belt, there is a learning belt. I think there are significant opportunities uh, in, in West Africa and, in, and I think as well as in Haiti and I think to the extent that governments can help in sharing risk and in terms of helping to support improved governance like you've discussed and improving the rule of law that we're going to be able to, if we have nine out of the ten jobs are in the private sector, we need to find ways to improve the private sector and there's certainly a role for DFAT-D, there's certainly a role for other donors in that, and so really appreciate you sharing your perspective on that. I also appreciate it, JP, joining us from uh, IFC at a time when it's very busy, given that it's the annual meetings this week. So please join me in thanking the minister and JP for this very interesting conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to have uh, we're going to have a set change. We're going to have my friends come up about the trade and development nexus. You've got two or three minutes, and we're going to start in three minutes. So if you guys want to get coffee, you have three minutes to do it. We're going to start in three minutes. Thanks, everybody.